So I think we're going to start. Um, welcome to this uh, book lounge. Um, as a chair of the publications committee, it is a pleasure to introduce the enlarged and revised version of Florence Guignard's book, The Infantile in Psychoanalytic Practice Today. This new book will be part of the Psychoanalytic Ideas and Application series, one of the five series of the IPI, IPA Publications Committee. The aim of this series is to focus on the efforts of significant authors whose work are outstanding contributions to the development of the psychoanalytic field. The second goal is to set out relevant ideas and themes generating during the history of psychoanalysis that deserve to be known and discussed by the psychoanalytic community and with professionals in, all, in other related disciplines so as to expand their knowledge and generate a productive interchange between the text and the reader. In this book, Florence Vignard gathers her theoretical and clinical views of the last 10 years. The common thread throughout is the notion of the infantile. In doing so, she masterfully takes us through a most interesting journey that conveys the many theoretical and clinical facets of this essential psychoanalytic notion, which has become central to the psychoanalytic thinking. The concept of the infantile has now spread into all of the IPA psychoanalytic regions. The publications of Florence Vignard's book is extremely timely and pertinent, given that the theme of the IPA Congress is the infantile, which I strongly encourage you to register and participate. Not only does the author convey her theoretical and clinical propositions on the notion of the infantile, but through, throughout one can recognize and appreciate her concern for the historic development of psychoanalytic theory and of its future. One also appreciates her rigor and her continuous search to articulate concepts from different psychoanalytic cultures. Her knowledge and mastery of psychoanalysis from, from psychoanalysts from different regions of the world is remarkable. I would like to remind you that the IPA Publications Committee is always looking for proposals. You can find the information about how to send a book proposal in the IPA website. Before having Florence Guignard present her book, I want to introduce her. Florence Guignard was born in Jenin, Switzerland. She is a clinical psychologist, a researcher, and a psychoanalyst. She's a past president and a training analyst in the Paris Psychoanalytic Society. She is a training member of the IPA for Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis, past chair and present counselor of the IPA Committee on Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis. She founded the Psychoanalysis for Children's Association in 1984 and the European Society of Psychoanalysis of Children and Adolescents. She chaired the, the team of the L'Anne Psychanalytique Internationale, which involves selection, translation, and publication of papers from the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. She has published more than 200 papers in psychoanalytic journals and books. She has published four books, the first one, Au vif de l'infantile, the second one, Epitre à l'objet. The third one, Quelle psychanalyse pour le 20 siècle, which appeared in English in 2019. Au vif de l'infantile aujourd'hui, which is a book we're launching today that is appearing in English. And she's working on two new books that will appear in 2022. La psychanalyse dans la cité and autobiography. So please, Florence, tell us about your book. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody. I'm terribly moved because I've seen so many of my friends in, in the, on the screen. Then I would like really to thank thoroughly the IPA Publication Committee who accepted to publish my present book, 
the infantile in psychoanalytic practice today in its series, Psychoanalytic Ideas and Applications. The committee has been an important and constant support, both friendly and financial. The committee it allowed me, the committee allowed me to have the book translated into English and printed by the Taylor and Francis group of Routledge. I am particularly happy and honored to be introduced and discussed today by Dr. Gabriela Legoretta, chair of the IPA publication committee, who wrote such a kind foreword for my book. And in addition to it, she happens to be a remarkable debater. And I owe her several parts of today's presentation as she knows how to ask the good questions to help the author to clarify her descriptions. The French edition of this book was issued in March, 2020, just at the beginning of the lockdown due to the COVID pandemic. So that nothing was done until today to launch its publication in French and propose it to be reviewed. This is why I take the opportunity to thank here all the friends who contributed to its French publication. My gratitude goes first to my excellent friend and estimate colleague, Sestro Marcello Passone, who wrote an outstanding preface full of his subtle and creative understanding of the topic. I would like to tell him here my deep gratitude and my faithful affection. I also deeply thank Jeremy Tancred co-editor of the editions ITAC in Paris that published and revised a revised version of my 1996 book with additional chapters. Jeremy did a patient and precise work in rereading my the manuscript and wrote a beautiful and thoughtful editor's note. To come now to the English edition I want to thank Andrew Weller, the exceptional and well-known translator of so many great nouns in psychoanalysis, for having accepted to translate it into English, this second book of mine, he also translated the first, after the first one, uh, Gabriela mentioned it, psychoanalytic concept and technique in development two years ago. I'm very happy that he, Andrew accepted to be with us today. And I hope he will give his linguistic and translated point of view about the infantile, a noun, a substantive that constitutes indeed such an odd formulation for the English language. Many thanks also to my young friend, Michael Vilches, the tal talented stylist of Forbidden Denimeries, who proposed the cover illustration, which suggests the weaving of psychoanalytic practice and theory in a contemporary matter, the genes matter. Mm. I want also to thank Liliana Castro, chair of IPSO, who has beautifully organized my webinar with IPSO candidates allowing me to communicate with young psychoanalysts all over the world, and then translating my paper into Portuguese for, it, for the Portuguese review of psychoanalysis. Talking with so many young candidates was an forget, unforgettable experience for me. I'm very happy that she accepted to be with us today. I'm sure she will contribute with her pertinent remarks to the discussion that will follow. Last but not least, I would like to express all my gratitude to our fantastic IPA president and my dear friend, Virginia Unger, 
who encouraged me to expose my work on the infantile in various preparatory webinars and during the Congress to come, whose topic is precisely the infantile, as you know. I shall have the opportunity to do so also in the Congress, namely in a co-cap workshop together with my, with my colleagues and friends, Christine Anzieux, Julio Goyard, and Caroline Seon. I listened to several, of course, not only mine, I listened to several IPA webinars about the topic. And I discovered such a variety of conceptions of the infantile that I have no doubt about the vividness and the richness of our debates at the online Congress in a few weeks. Now, before I give you a brief overview of my book, would Andrew Weller accept to say a few words about his experience as a translator of it? Andrew? Yes, we're very happy to, Florence. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, I met you uh, already back in the 1980s, I think in the late 1980s, a very long time ago now. And uh, so it's a real pleasure uh, about 20, 25 years later or 30 years later, uh, me to have the opportunity to translate uh, two of your books now, and um, and I'm really pleased that this latest book called The Infant Hour, um is coinciding, the publication of this book is coinciding with the IPA um, conference and so forth. I think that's fantastic. Um, congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, we also met, a lot before I began to translate this book, we met, I remember, in a in a bar in Paris and talked a little bit about the project, yes. and you, you asked me, uh, whether I thought, uh, you know, it would be possible to call the book The Infantile with a capital and so forth. And, well, in the webinar a couple of weeks ago, you, um, uh, which I listened to retrospectively because I wasn't able to be there, you said that I had, I had said that it was impossible. <laughs> <laughs> to say this. My recollection is not that. My recollection is that I said that it was possible but that it was awkward. Uh, I thought mm. it was awkward. It was like all these um, tendency in French to nominalize, substantivize the adjectives. Mm. And, you know, there are many, many examples, le, mat le maternel, le féminin, mm -hmm. etc., which mm, are sometimes it translated like that in English, the maternal, the feminine, or it might be the, the maternal sphere, feminine sphere or register or whatever, which I prefer. Um, but, and uh, so we talked about that, and um, I think that, uh, I can't even remember now which of the two books it was, but I remember in one of your articles, which is included probably in The Infantile, that the, another translator referred to it as the infantile part of the personality or the infantile part of the analyst, or the patient. And that speaks to me much more clearly in English than speaking about the infantile uh, as in French. So those, those are my feelings about it. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when we then have to talk about the two infantiles, I find this trains sort of <laughs> normal English usage, but it's fine as well. And the translator also has a, a problem here of, um, you know, how far do you go towards in the direction of strategies of towards um, accentuating foreignness in the translation or how far do you want to go in the direction of domestication and different theories of translation um, support one view and others support another view. Mm -hmm. And I try to tread a, a sort of middle path between fidelity to the source text and um, transparency in terms of, you know, writing uh, idiomatic English. And it's not an easy path to tread. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and the other thing is that when you introduce um, terms like new terms from in French, there are an awful lot of terms, you know, like, well, as we know, Africa and, and uh, all sorts of words, le perceptif and de musain, the itali d'antital, etc. When you, all these terms, there are so many of them that it is, it is a problem for a translator. And, yes. um, I, I, uh, 
I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that, uh, uh, to introduce these terms. And I think in, in, in many ways they enrich the, the target language as well. I mean, you can argue like that. It is an enrichment and, and it, mm -hmm. preserves the, it sort of preserves the author's meaning to do mm -hmm. that because a mm -hmm. translation can be flattening, can't it? Um, you know, it can flatten the sense. So it's sometimes better to preserve the term that the author actually is using in their language. And so I'm, I'm actually fine with that. And I think the infantile, spent, I found it in Freud's writing somewhere. I was looking through and I, I came across the infantile, of course, with, not with a capital letter, but I found the infantile. So it doesn't disturb me at all. Um, and I think, uh, you know, absolutely fine. And um, as far as translating your book was concerned, I um, was happy to discover that I did not suffer too much. Um, <laughs> because uh, trans <laughs> translating can be quite, uh, uh, I do suffer quite a lot with my translations. And um, I found it quite, uh, you know, I think you have a very good style in French, a little bit complicated uh, sometimes. Uh, you know, very long sentences sometimes, and 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 it's difficult to it needs reformulating in English to read well. And but um, I found that I could translate it to relatively easily. And when there were problems, um, you know, with specific terms, then I sent the text to you, and and you were very very helpful in um, explaining what you wanted to say. And and as you say, we we managed pretty well together in doing that and yes. I think we got I think we got a good result um, so uh, no it was it was a pleasure to translate both of your books now thank um, you uh, I, the, 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 would you like to ask me any question about the, the thing uh, further than that I, I said a few made a few points but would you, would you like to make so, uh, so, uh, a few points now? No, I was asking you whether you want to ask me a question, well, a specific well, question about I, it, because I, I might, said what's on my mind. What I would suggest was, uh, would be that maybe uh, in the part devoted to questions to, to, for everybody, that perhaps uh, I might suggest that some of you would ask Andrew some questions about something that uh, is not clear in what I say, because you might help also. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, just, just one more thing. Yes. Because, you know, I think the infantile is a, a huge subject and there are obviously many, many aspects to it, and a lot of which I probably don't even understand at all. So um, that's okay. Uh, what, for me, the, when I think of the infantile, I think of, as I say, the infantile part in the adult. And as you said in the webinar, um, I think personally that it's very important to um, be able to stay in contact with uh, the child in oneself. Um, whatever that, you know, what means by that? But I mean, the, I think that the child in oneself is a tremendous source of um, spontaneity, play, creativity, etc. You know, I'm. I know, uh, 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 as well as translating, I am a painter, and I think that I draw a great deal on my child self, mm. and um, uh, you know, on play and all this sort of thing. So, you know, uh, I think uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the, that whole area from that point of view. Um, I don't uh, necessarily understand all the metapsychology that you <laughs> develop, <laughs> but. <laughs> That doesn't matter. You know. okay. you don't necessarily have to understand it all to be able to translate it. I, I, oh, I dare say. Yes, <laughs> yes. French is the same. Sometimes you just have to manage without understanding everything. Thank yeah. you, Andrew. And I'm but, not a psychoanalyst, so you know that. Excuses yeah, me but you understand. I, 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 you know, I can say I, I agree that we, we could collaborate in such a good way that was a really fantastic for, for me too. Thank you for this uh, witnessing and uh, very interesting part of it because I think we cannot think of interpreting without thinking of translating and uh, translator. Um, I am 
I have a small experience of to translate. I translated some books and many uh, papers, uh, mainly for from Anna Siegel in in the other way, of course, in the other yes. side, uh, from Anna Siegel and um, uh, Ogden and. Uh, uh, Don Meltzer, of course, because I worked a lot with him. So I know the problems and I know also the advantages not to be sort of stuck in one only language because it enlarges the, the, the scope if we have to think in two languages at least. Sure. Thank you very much. So, um, Gabriela, shall I go on with? Absolutely, go ahead. Now, uh, I see half of me. <laughs> well, that's already something. Uh, would Rhoda put me just smaller, but <laughs> so that I could uh, can see you and see see me? That's probably very narcissistic, but it helps me to be in contact with what I say. Is it possible? Rhoda? Oh, hello. I see many of my friends, but I don't see me anymore now. Anyway, I, I shall start reading. Now, when you present a book, you say a little bit of what is in it, not all, otherwise people will not buy the book. And this would be a pity. Um, so I am going to try to make this exercise as well as possible. This book is devoted to a theoretical and technic reflect, technical reflection in several areas of the contemporaneous psychoanalytic practice. I start the book with the proposition of a new concept. It's a new concept, the infantile with a capital letter. Classically, based on, the, on Freud's many uses of its adjective form, infantile sexuality, infantile neurosis, infantile sexual theories. The level of complexity of the infantile with a capital letter and a noun, when it becomes a noun, places it in the category of what I named the concept of the third type. These concepts are made of several elements the concept of the third type. They have a complex and polymorphous, but also specific identity. That is to, to deal with, so to speak, the links between the links to, to express the complexity. I'm going to give some examples. For instance, Winnicott's transitional object, Marion Milner's malleable object, Gohut's concept of the self, or Ogden's analytics third. To, 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 just to, to, to mention some of them. These are parts of this category of concepts that I call the concept of third type. The concept of infantile was born from my interest on the normal and universal processes of transference and counter-transference, and from the importance I give to them as being the primum movens, primum movens in Latin, of any psychoanalytic process. <clears throat> By investigating the difficulties happening in this field along our everyday work of psychoanalysts, I came to the conclusion that the whole dynamics of the transference counter transference relationship takes place between the infantile of the analyzant 
and the infantile of the analyst. This means that the projection on us by our patient of his parental objects is the projection of his infantile view of them and that our capacity to take the right di dimension of the emotional drama of the situation lies in our own infantile. The first part of my sentence is very classical, no wonder. It's the part of the analyzing. The second part I pretend is my definition of the, the situation of the infantile in the, in the psychoanalytic process or work. Only the impact of the patient's infantile upon our own infantile is able to allow us to understand and qualify the nature of the parental object projected into us. For instance, when our analyzant is experiencing us as a castrating father or a seducive or seductive mother, to say a very classical example of it, the emotional understanding of his fantasy is located in our own infantile, i.e. in the place where we experience something similar, similar conflict, of course, not the same. Should we not take this personal experience in the here and now situation of the session, we would only talk about analysis instead of practicing it, as Bian said, I quote Bian here. This is true even in the case when the analyzant had important trauma. The deepest and conscious part of our capacity of identification and empathy lies in our infantile. Baby observation and neurosciences bring about important discoveries on the precocity of empathy, empathy in babies, implicit prenatal memories, and so on. So, you know, uh, we underestimated the competences of of the children and of babies. Developing the concept of the infantile allowed me to discover some very interesting aspects of the analytic relationship, such as what I call blind spots in the counter-transference and stopper interpretations in the psychoanalysis, I analyze everyday activity. And the first chapter of my book, coming back to it, is developing this topic. Maybe I could just say a few words about it and I shall then uh, mention what happens in the, the other chapters because they seem to me to be interesting enough to have been published as well. But to say a few words about stopper interpretation and blind spot or the other way around. In the normal course of a treatment, a basic mode and rhythm proper to each analytic relationship arises and the analyst learns to observe the particular tone of its process. This specific rhythm may, however, be disrupted because it's analogous to the rhythm of breathing or blood circulation minor disturbances may remain unnoticed. However, an important disturbance may happen whose symptom is a sudden and total lack of representation coming to our mind. Such an event is usually observed in the analyzant and attributed to a movement in the transference 
but one can also observe it in the analyst and this will have to be linked to power transfers, count transfers. Sorry for the lapses, it was a good one. I discovered that such an experience was felt at an uh, unconscious, preconscious level, like the loss of an internal meaningful object, no matter if good or, or bad. Not no matter, but it could be a good or bad, but it's always a meaningful internal object, a feeling of loss, just intuitively. To designate this sudden absence of representation, which has caught the analyst unaware, I use the term of blind spot. And as we always defend ourselves against our feelings of loss, I try to observe how we analysts manage in the case of a blind spot. To do so, we have first to observe what bothered us at that particular moment of the cure, of the, the treatment. It might be, for instance, the feeling of irritation against a person of our patient's surroundings, past or present surroundings. This indicates that we are this person in the transference at, the, at, the, at that moment and that we have to know what to do with this negative part of our patient's transference, how and when to interpret it. This is an example, it's not only the negative part, but it may be more strike, striking to give this example. In front of this unpleasant situation of void in our capacity to have a representation of what is going on, the analyst will tend to avoid it, to stop it. Precisely, for instance, with what I called stopper interpretations. Thank you, Andrew, because the first translation was plug interpretation, but stopper interpretation is just to the point. So I give some examples of them. For instance, to repeat for the 10th time or third time even, an interpretation already proposed several times without any result and to pretend that the analyzer doesn't accomplish his part of the job or doesn't want to listen to us. Instead of thinking that maybe we do not say the right thing to be listened to. This is a plug in, a stopper interpretation. Or to give the analyzant a piece of analytic theory, such as what you say here is typical of an Oedipus complex, which is a good example of talking about psychoanalysis instead of working at it, and so on. So I will stop here for the first, about the first chapter and talk a little bit of the next ones because time is running. In the next cha chapters, I consider the spontaneous defensive activity of every human being, including psychoanalysts, when confronted to certain psychoanalytic discoveries. For instance, I have a chapter on the defenses against infantile, the discovering of infantile sexuality. The defenses against the, this discovery, of course, we know, all of know that it's infantile sexual theories. But I contend that we, or I just observe that we shall unconsciously fight against infantile, uh, this discovery of infantile sexuality by means of infantile sexual theories all day long, all lifelong. 
when Freud made this unbelievable discovery of a genital infantile sexuality, he discovered as well the defenses against it, defenses that could be an illusory relief because it could be understood as being only a question of milk, pee, and poo. But this is by far not the case. For instance, I heard yesterday that in China, a huge lobby of restaurants and takeaway hamburgers, no name, uh, created a special dish in order for women to be able to eat their hamburger without other people seeing their mouth open. So this is a reality or? Okay, I didn't uh, invent it. In another chapter, I develop my ideas about the utmost importance of the unconscious feeling of guilt in the child that will keep this feeling of guilt will keep on being active within the infantile of every adult with the good side of it also, because there is always a bad side and a good side to things, even in, in psychoanalysis. And the good side of the guilt of the in the child is that is the desire and the capacity he has to repair, capacity of reparation. And of course, we all know, we all here are using this capacity of reparation. So it should be linked also to our feeling of guilt in our infantile. In another chapter, I start from Bian's seminal description of ego drives, you know, L plus or minus, or plus or minus L, plus or minus H, and plus or minus K. And I investigate from there, from there the relationship of love and hate with the epistemophilic drive, K drive. I discuss it through an imaginary dialogue between Freud and Leonardo da Vinci, because they did disagree on the kind of relation between the two, the two. In another chapter, I developed some ideas about the question of the feminine in men. The feminine, this is another <laughs> substantive. Uh, with an exploration, I did it uh, uh, so with an exploration of Mozart's and Da Ponte de Don Giovanni. I chose this image of the universal uh, Don Juan uh, because I thought that music was bringing something more from the, the emotional point of view. Later on, I worked a lot about the topic of the feminine and the maternal compo component in every human being. In another chapter, I examined the relation between the body ego and the thinking processes, the body ego and especially the digestive system like, of course, Bian made it and I developed his uh, ideas of Bian and my own experience, clinical experience. In another chapter, I'm dealing with the psychoanalyst situation in the various institution he or she is working in, medical, educational. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately becoming a more rare, the more and more rare, um, but it's a difficult situation anyway, but so fascinating and interesting. I have another chapter, no wonder, to advocate the importance of child analysis practice for the monitoring of our countertransference in adult analysis. And then I have written two chapters which have been uh, added to, to, to the other ones. 
uh, to approach the question of puberty and adolescence today, I could have written much more. I have at least two chapters in this book. The other ones will come later. And I conclude with some thoughts about the future of psychoanalysis in the world to come, which is a huge question. So this is my contribution. And um, now I think Gabriella will speak, go on speaking. So uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we're now going to move to the part of questions and answer. And I want to introduce Liliana Castro. She is a psychiatrist and training candidate of the Portuguese Society of Psychoanalysis and a member of IPSO, the International Psychoanalytic Studies Organization. Liliana will be hosting our questions and answers period. Go ahead. Liliana. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, I want to thank the invitation to be here. And I'm very happy that we are celebrating together the new book of Florence Kinnard and to congratulate Florence for more this achievement of hers. Uh, and I also want to thank her for being so open to share her ideas with the candidates in psychoanalysis. She's very close to our um, training institution and uh, to the IPSO. Um, and we are all we have been learning a lot with her and want to thank her for that. Uh, I also would like to greet all the participants and organizers of this book launch and thank you all for your presence. It's a great honor for me to be here and to moderate now this space for questions and answers uh, that you might have to Florence Kinnard about her book and her work. Um, and for making these questions, we'll be using both the hand raising option in Zoom. You can uh, hand raise and then uh, open your camera and uh, present and ask directly to Florence your question or um, otherwise you can also use the chat function and then I can uh, read your questions if you don't want to open the camera or ask directly. Uh, I also remind you that we will uh, have for the participants uh, who are making questions, we'll having a prize draw for one copy of the book. So it's also uh, good to have your participation. And so uh, we are now open to your questions. I can start with uh, maybe with a question to open uh, the discussion and also people uh, can uh, write their own uh, questions uh, for your work in the, um, in the chat. So um, I, I, must, I, I will do this question, what are the biggest challenge you see for analysts in training nowadays in working uh, analytically with the infantile? Well, uh, can, can you can you can you say why it's such a, a challenge for for, for you? <laughs> uh, no, I was uh, thinking on these uh, concepts that you've been bringing uh, about the um, infantile side or the infantile dimension, both in uh, the analyst that is activated in, in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was also thinking that this could be a major challenge for uh, someone uh, that starts training also because at the same time he's starting in the being part of an institute of uh, mm -hmm. uh, a bigger association. So uh, maybe you can, um, and because you also are, have been reflecting in the challenges, the future challenges for psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, and this also includes the, 
the training analysts, the people that are the candidates, maybe that I'm more focused on this because I'm a candidate, but uh, it would be good to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. So do you, do you want me to say something more about it or? Yes, if you want to say something about uh, what you see like also the challenges for uh, yes. nowadays uh, analytical training. Yes, I think so. I think so because um, I noticed that it is difficult for each of us to really uh, go back to the part of oneself in is uh, which is the most sensitive, which has the most sensitive way of listening to our patients, and uh, I think that if we can imagine that we are listening with our infantile. Um, it brings back not, uh, not so much um, conscious, uh, uh, co conscious uh, memories of what happened to us, but an atmosphere of childhood. And um, there are there have been uh, there have been many very interesting books uh, written on empathy and on feelings on on identification of course um, but if we separate all these concepts in our um, clinical um, listening it doesn't work one has to have this concept of the third type, what I call them, um, link, links between the links, to understand with all these capacities that are all fresh and spontaneous in childhood. Otherwise, we are talking about analysis. Maybe you could close those who are not speaking, could you close your microphone because we hear what you say? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I, uh, I... Yes, thank you, Florence. Uh, I see also Gabriella has a question, so I will give her, she has a hand raised. I will give her the word. Please, Gabriella. It's exactly, I think, related to what just has been said, I, I wonder if you can tell us more about the specificity or the identity of the third concept uh, and the, the link between the links. I find that very interesting. Yes. Can you can tell us a little bit more. You already said something about it. Uh, maybe you can. You want me to add something? Well, you know, I made, uh, I am a fan of. Okay, uh, um, I think we cannot uh, think properly if we don't have. Uh, sorry, but there are people talking. Can you call, can you call uh, close your mi microphones, please? <laughs> yes, I, I would all ask all the participants to close the microphones because we are having some back noises. If it's possible for all the participants, except for the ones who are uh, making questions, to close their uh, microphones, it, we would think so we can hear Florence and the questions. <laughs> I think I think the host has the capacity to mute everybody yeah. so that yeah, so so someone may be aware of your computer. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, better. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, Florence, uh, you okay. can uh, finish answer. Thank you. I'm sorry for this interruption. So just, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Rhoda. So uh, I think um, uh, the concept of the third type are very complex concepts. Well, what I was saying was that uh, if we want to work properly, we have to have good tools and we have to to identify the, the tools to know which is which. There are um, uh, some concepts are fairly simple in their denomination at least, although they might, they might have a very complex uh, um, content. For instance, if we speak of the drive, we know more or less what we mean by the, the name. Uh, this is a rel relatively simple concept from that point of view. It's a limit, the concept of limits, a limit concept, border concept, but it is not um, a, a mosaic of things. If we think of projective identification, uh, which is a concept I work a lot about, and uh, it, I guess it's not finished because I am part of the encyclopedia of the IPA and I have all, um, all the possible difficulties to, to see how we can uh, agree between the different uh, person who are dealing with it. Projective identification is a, com a complex concept with at least two links. It works both ways. And as I'm not going to get into this problem today, please. Um, there are still more complex concepts which deal with links between the links. This is what I wanted to, uh, to exemplify. I didn't uh, invent it, you know. Uh, Winnicott, when, when he, he talks of, of uh, um, transitional objects, it's a very complicated object. It's a, a little bit of the mother, a little bit of the child, it's a, a little bit of, of the thing itself. So it's the link between the links that make this concept. This is what I meant. And okay. I think the, the infantile is also one of these concepts. Thank you. We have also a question in the chat from Juan Eduardo Tizon, and he asks how the infantile of the analyst may be useful in the analytic process? Well, because we are analyzed. It's useful because we are analyzed, because uh, what I didn't mention, maybe it was, uh, it's, uh, thank you Juan for your question, because it's not, take, it's not evident. Uh, it's useful because we are analyzed and because we are analyzed, we make links between our infantile and our adult parts. Uh, Don Meltzer talked a lot about adult parts in children. And as I worked for years and years with him, of course, I took the counterpart and saying, why not talking of the infantile parts? But as analysts, we know how to, we have the experience to have made the links between our infantile and our adult parts. And it's, if we only have adult parts, we are not, uh, we are talking about analysis. We are not working as analysts. Of course, if we had only infantile parts, uh, we wouldn't be analysts either. We need both and we need all the work of our own analysis uh, uh, to have made the links between the two. Is it? Thank you. Uh, we also have the hand raised by Guillaume Perret. 
So I would invite uh, Guillaume to ask uh, his question. Thank you, Guillaume. Yes, hello. Um, hello. I would like to know uh, about the blind spots, if you can explain a little bit more, because uh, I was thinking blind spot, it means you don't realize that you are in a blind spot yourself because it's blind. Exactly. Um, and uh, that's why I wanted to know. And just also, um, uh, just I'm, I'm curious, uh, Liliana Castro, you have a watch behind you that doesn't work or it's working? <laughs> it's, uh, it's true. It's true. Uh... It's without the battery. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. The time stops uh, when <laughs> in the book launch. You know, what is miraculous here is that we, have, we all have different clocks and different times in the day. This is very moving for me. <laughs> so to answer you, uh, that's exactly the problem. And this brings me to uh, advertise. <laughs> um, the uh, way to work in groups, small groups. Uh, of course, you are right. When you are in a blind spot, you don't know that you are in a blind spot, except that if you are an analyst, um, you have a sort of, uh, you are used to, to give attention to what is going on in your head during the session, not only on the head of the analysis that you have to guess, but also on your own head. And if suddenly you are, you know, without any representation, something begins to work in your, in your head, that something is wrong, it doesn't work. Now, I agree with you, most of time, it's, um, very difficult for us to get out of a blind spot just by ourselves. It might happen in the good days, but in the bad days, we need help. We need help of another analyst or of a group of analysts. You know, I'm working a lot with uh, the method of weaving thoughts of Stalomanson or Heidi Feinberg, uh, the third listening. The, these methods that allow other people just to say what they feel, because in this situation, you have probably the, the purest way of the analyst to function, because they are, we are not totally um, uh, embarrassed with uh, theoretical or clinical informations. We just listen to the analyst talking about his case or her case. So it, it helps. Thank, Thank you, you Florence. Yes. Thank you, Guillaume. We also have a um, hand raised by Carmen Zelaya. So I would invite Carmen to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. It's afternoon here in Peru. Uh, I'm very glad, uh, Florence, uh, to listen to all your knowledge because I have been following um, your, your papers. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned about the feminine and the maternal. I'm very interested in that uh, topic because I've been working in postpartum depression. I'm sorry, so, I don't hear you very well, and I don't see you, which is uh, frustrating. But I <laughs> <laughs> maybe you well, can okay. activate your camera, Carmen. Uh, okay, okay. So we Just can uh, see you. Thank you. Okay. Now you can see me, Florence. No. No. Uh, yes. Now we can see your image. Now we have uh, Carmen on image, Florence. Maybe. Maybe when you talk, Carmen, too, maybe okay. Florence will. Okay. See you. No, I, I was saying that I'm very glad <laughs> if, you, if you speak close to your computer. Oh, that's it. Uh, if you speak close to it so I can hear you. Go okay. on. Okay. Uh, Florence, I'm very glad to hear you. I've been following some of your. Uh, presentation the last one you you were in in brazil yes so when you met, uh, I, I was following you 
And now I've heard you mention about the feminine and the maternal. Yes. I'm very, yes. I'm very interested in this topic because I've been working for years in postpartum depression. So uh, I would like to, to know uh, what do you think about the working through uh, from the body experience to the uh, identity building? I don't know if, if we can express it that way, but how the mother builds her identity from the body experience, having her baby and then um, nurturing him. Is it clear? Uh you know yes we but we 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 should have a, we should have a, um, another zoom on it because it's uh, it, well i wrote uh, some things about the maternal space and the fem feminine space as uh, locus of the development in the child very very early but this is in my other book uh, it's the other book that has been translated into English, um, where I speak of these. And um, I think we could imagine once to, to have a webinar by, uh, in which we could communicate about these so important uh, uh, matters, because you also have other, many interesting things to communicate with, because you work in, in this field particularly. In the book I'm uh, launching today, I do, I do not um, work a lot on, on this matter. So I'm sorry not to be able to, sorry to frustrate you. <laughs> I will not uh, be able to answer really very precisely on that topic because it, it's uh, it would take us too too much time. I think. I think that we're coming to Thank the you. end. Thank you. Sorry. I suggest we accept one more question and then we we'll wrap up. Okay. So uh, we have the hand raised by our Levine. We'll have also a question in the chat, but uh, we are giving priority to. Uh, people that hand raise and uh, make direct questions. So if we, then we can send uh, the question in the chat to Florence after. Thank you. And so I invite our Levine to make his question. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Florence, and congratulations on your book. <clears throat> I wanted to raise the question about links and, and ask you if you could say a bit more about that, about, for example, do you distinguish between links and object relations? Uh, object relations are driven by uh, desire, by need, and there is some degree of uh, intentional motivation in making an attachment to an object. Um, the way I think about links, and this is a, a very preliminary assumption on my part is that links happen and they're, they don't necessarily have the same quality of motivation uh, uh, that, that comes from a self. In fact, the whole, the whole question of origin of links may be prior to self-object differentiation and it may be a uh, 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 a function that begins prior to self-object differentiation in the infant and continues throughout life as an attribute that uh, accompanies or may assist object relating. So it's, I think it's a very, very complicated term that can easily be oversimplified and confounded with something to do with relationship and attachment. And uh, since you're emphasizing links between links, a kind of tertiary function, uh, perhaps you can say a bit more about how you think about it. Yes. 
Yes. Um, well, uh, I think I, I agree with you. I think links begin probably in the uterine life. I mean, if I trust what the discoveries of, uh, for instance, uh, implicit memories that have been developed and uh, explicited by, namely by Mauro Mancha in his book, Feeling the World. Uh, I think links begin, start at, at that moment. Um, you are making the difference between, uh, uh, about the, the differentiation between the self and the object, uh, which correspond, I would say, in uh, another way of considering things, uh, to the difference between a part object relation and a full object relation. So I think um, it's very important, in fact, to agree that links uh, start be before uh, object relation. If we consider an uh, object relation uh, only, only from the moment when uh, the object is a full object, not a part object. I don't know if you will agree with that, Howard. But it's nice to have asked. Thank you for asking. And Catalina is here. Thank you. So we will have a last question by the hand raised for Catalina Bronstein. And then we will send the questions in the chat that we will, won't have time for all these questions in the chat and send them to Florence. So she maybe can answer later to the person if she agrees. So Catalina Bronstein, please, you can make your question, your last, uh, the last question to Florence. Thank you. Thanks, Florence. It's great to have your book being published by uh, the Publications Committee. Um, I, I was very interesting. You've got a chapter on the wish to know, basically. And, um, and I think what you're talking about, blind spot, maybe uh, is very much linked to that, too. And you connect, uh, you talk about the desire to learn to know in connection to the infantile sexual fantasies. And, but you make a connection which I thought was interesting, but I wonder whether you could say something a bit more between what you see like as an unconscious sadistic conformism in the adult, some a response in the adult to knowing about sexual fantasies. And you, you make all this connection in relation to hands. And uh, I just wonder whether you can explain that and uh, particularly in connection to knowing. Yes. Uh, yes, there are many, many connections with the desire to know. One of the connections ca that can be made, and maybe it would, uh, it, it, it's a way to, to consider what you are, uh, your question, is um, the fact that um, if we consider the uh, primary sadism of the child as I consider it personally as a sort of fighting for to survive. So to grasp the object, even if, if you have to mis, uh, uh, maltreat, mistreat uh, the object, I think that the environment of the child can help this uh, primary sadism, which is a sort of survival defense, uh, and direct it towards desire to know. Because there is also something not sadistic, but intrusive in the desire to know. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one of these concepts that are also, because these are the ego drives, and these concepts of ego drives are border concept and very complex concept as, as well. So this is one part of the thing. Now, the other thing about the defenses of the adults against uh, um, child sexuality, uh, infantile sexuality, this is your question. In fact, they try to sort of um, 
disconnect themselves and their uh, attention uh, from it by saying, oh, it's only, you know, oral drive or anal drive. Anal drive has, is much uh, successful in analysis, but still uh, it's also reduced because we lose very often the, the genital side of the question and the infantile genital side, the fact that uh, anality is not an end by itself, it's it, an expression of a genital uh, um, organization, infantile organization. So, uh, you know, we are used to defend ourselves. I think each, uh, all our development is made through defenses. The, the, the problem is to, to choose them or to uh, embetter them or to make them more soft, uh, softer, and uh, we have to, to live with them. I don't know if I answered, uh, answered Yes, that. I think you have. I, I, thought, I thought it was so important bringing the connection between the, the infantile, the fantasies, and the, the wish to know and to learn about, you know, about ourselves and others. And as yes. you say, like, you know, to talk about the blind spots too. Yes, yes, I think it's, it's wider than just uh, the, the, what we hear very often is the, the, the desire to know how children are made because now, you know, all the children know how babies are made. I, I think that it has always been like that. Then we have to, to deal with the defenses against it, mm -hmm. which is so important. And um, it's not an end in, in itself. This is what is subtle, and this is why the question of sublimation is always a, a side question in all the systems of thoughts in analysis, because we don't know how it works, in fact. The sublimation is something that uh, starts from water to vapor, so it's the same. We don't know what happens, but we can also think that analysis and also education can help to uh, enhance the interest of the child for developing uh, an interest to, to know how or to know why or to know what uh, instead of acting immediately. But this is exactly contrary to what happens in our society today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much all the participants for your questions and to Florence for all the answers and comments. So it's time now to close this space for questions and answers. I'll announce the winner of the book prize and the winner of uh, Florence Kinar's new book is Judith Setson Marcus. Uh, the, win the winner can send an email with his name and address to Roda and Roda's email will be in the last slide in the end of this book launch. So I'll now give the word to Gabriella for the closing of this book launch and final remarks and thank you. Well, I just have to thank again Florence Guignard for this great contribution to psychoanalytic thinking and all of you for having participated. I think it's been a very stimulating uh, discussion. I'm sure that if we have more time, we can go on for a long period of time, but we'll have other opportunities to do so. So I'll just pass the word to, to Florence to say the last words for the book lunch. Well, the last word. For, from me is thank you, thank to all of you. It has been a fantastic event for me to have you all around and thank you to all the, uh, the, the people who, who took a responsibility to make this meeting so vivid that uh, you are all, all of you are in my environment. Thank you very, very much. Just the last information, don't forget that you can order the book with uh, a 30% off uh, and uh, you can do it directly 
uh, uh, contacting Rhoda at the IPA. So thank you so much to, for everyone, to everyone, and uh, we'll, I wish you all have a great summer. Thank you for all who, the, the written messages, that's a fantastic contribution to. Thank you. Thank you.